Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Wright Platice, Special Advisor to the Chancellor for International Agriculture at CSU's Spur Campus in Denver, Colorado. I'm excited to be with you this afternoon and to introduce some exciting collaborations that we have underway, both here in Colorado and worldwide, and to be a part of the International Livestock Forum. As you know, the Live ILF is a collaboration between Colorado State University and the National Western Stock Show, which began in 2015. Its focus is on exploring important opportunities and challenges in global livestock and meat production. Since its inception, the program has engaged world-renowned speakers, industry and community members, and more than 120 student fellows have gone through the program from 23 countries around the globe. We're excited to host you today. And I would like to take a moment to talk about the role of the land grant universities in global food production and in being able to feed a world someday of 10 billion people. At Colorado State University System, we take this seriously and have entered into a brand new and exciting collaboration that we want to share with you. At the site and intersection of I-70 and I-25, we are building the CSU Spur campus. It's at the historic location of the National Western, Western Stock Show. We anticipate someday that there will be 2 million visitor, visitors annually and at a site of 250 acres. The site will be a year round home to education, entertainment, business incubation, conferences and events. Our founding partners on this project include the Western Stock Show Association, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the History of Colorado Museum, and the City and County of Denver. So what will CSU Spur Campus be? What will it include? It will showcase the CSU system campuses, which includes CSU Fort Collins, CSU Global, and CSU Pueblo. It will be a place for public engagement, for convening, for teaching and research, and for partnering. Our CSU Spur Campus will consist of three buildings. One is focused on food, Terra, second on water, hydro, and a third on livestock and one health, Vida. In the Terra building, you will find soil, water, and plant service labs, a kitchen with sensory testing, urban and ag research and education will take place as we see this as an important place to convene both urban and rural agriculture, the Denver Metro Extension Center, and a Denver engagement hub. In the Hydro Building, you will find collaborative innovation and incubation spaces, research and teaching labs, the Western Water Policy Institute will be located there, the Center for Ag Innovation, community and educational spaces, and Denver's Waters Compliance Lab, as well as places to meet and greet. And in the Vita Building, and which is important for the International Livestock Forum, as this will be a place for year-round education, including K-12 educational facilities, an equine sports medicine program, and equine assisted activities and therapies at the Temple Grandin Equine Center, and small animal community outreach. We see CSU Spur campus as an opportunity to catalyze new and innovative ideas, to collaborate across research and opportunities to expand global food production in a sustainable way, and to convene, to meet together and to gather. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share with you our campus, which opens in 2022. The entire complex will be ready in 2024, and we look forward to seeing you in Denver. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our research activity that we're sharing and featuring today. As you know, there's no known vaccine for African swine fever, and currently there are several important international collaborations that are taking place one of which we'd like to share with you today. The work of Dr. Edward Okoth and his team at the International Livestock Research Institute located in Nairobi, Kenya, is an important partner in our facilitating this research effort. ILRI is a CGIAR center. It is co-hosted in Kenya and Ethiopia. There are 14 offices across Asia and Africa where they employ 700 staff. They are working together with my colleagues, Dr. Ray Goodrich and Dr. Lindsay Hartson, 
of the Infectious Disease Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. And today we will have an opportunity to view videos about this research, a live demo in the testing, and to take questions directly with Dr. Goodrich and Dr. Hartson. So I thank you for your time, excited that we could be together with you today, and looking forward to seeing you in Denver, Colorado at the CSU Spur campus. Thanks. Uh, my name is Edward Okoth. I work with the International Livestock Research Institute as a veterinarian and a senior scientist uh, within the animal and human health program. My area of research is on African swine fever. And today I'm going to present to you uh, on a topic on African swine fever vaccine development. Uh, we, in my talk today, I'll give you a brief um, introduction to the topic, and then this will be followed in the later parts of my talk uh, with a, pre a presentation on a research collaboration between ILRI and uh, CSU to develop an ASF vaccine. The International Livestock Research Institute is based in Africa and is co-hosted by two countries, that is Kenya and Ethiopia, with a number of satellite offices across Asia and Africa. Uh, ILRI is a member of the consultative group of international agriculture research uh, that uh, focuses on global research partnerships for a, fo a food secure future. The CGIAR science is dedicated to reducing poverty, enhancing food and nutritional security, and improving natural resources and ecosystem services. ILRI research is conducted in collaboration with these CGIAR centers, but also in close partnership with the uh, hundreds of partners, including national and regional research institutes, civil society organizations, academia, development organization, and uh, the private sector. Uh, the location of uh, the International Livestock Research Institute is very strategic for research in transboundary animal and zoonotic diseases of global concern because uh, where it is located in Africa and also in Asia, is where most of these diseases are endemic, and especially African swine fever that will be the topic of our discussion today. This makes the work and research in these diseases easier because containment requirements for them is minimal. Uh, now a, a brief background on the disease. African swine fever, is a, a very lethal disease that causes hemorrhagic fever that leads to very high mortality rates in domestic pigs. The disease can cause death of animals as quickly as a week after infection. The signs that you see in animals that are infected include the flushing of the skin or what commonly is called reddening and especially of the lower abdomen and the extremities uh, like ear and the, the legs. Uh, when you open up the dead animals, you see a lot of hemorrhages in most uh, tissue and organs of the body, including intestines, kidney, liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and many other parts of the body. The animal literally bleeds from inside and dies painfully. The causative agent of this disease is called African swine fever virus. It is a large double-stranded DNA virus in Aswaviridae family. Uh, African swine fever is endemic in sub-Saharan Africa and exists in the wild through a cycle of infection between ticks and wild pigs, and specifically bush pigs and warthogs. So this uh, circulation is very uh, important in that it's, it's is what maintains the virus in, in, in uh, Africa. And uh, once in a while, the virus jumps out of this system into naive pigs. 
And once it gets into naive pigs, then the virus spreads very rapidly and causes large economic losses. The major impact of this is that it discourages farmers from investing in pig keeping. And uh, to give you just an example, my own mother who is a pig keeper, she eventually converted her styes, pig styes into grain stores instead because the impact of this is very devastating. And now she has just resorted to uh, maintaining just a single sow, just because of the love and the value she attaches to pig keeping. So whereas this disease is endemic in Africa, it has also a, a very important uh, impact because it is capable of uh, spreading globally. And this has already been demonstrated in two instances. One in 1957, where this virus jumped from Angola into Portugal. 2007, we had a, another jump of this virus. And this particular jump then Russia and into Eastern Europe. Um, we had the first jump of Af the countries that are currently not infected by this disease are not immune to it, especially the US and Australia. And therefore it's very important that we uh, keep an eye on it and uh, get better tools for the control of the disease. Currently, the only control method that is available is implementation of strict biosecurity measures and stamp. Uh, these two control methods are very expensive and not affordable in the context of developing countries. And even in, developing, in developed countries, it is quite also uh, quite an investment to implement. And therefore, it's very important at this point in time that we develop better vaccines and therapeutics against African swine fever. Now, based on this, the fact that this virus is able to uh, spread from endemic areas, uh, for the example of Africa into other parts of the world, and the fact that the measures that and the tools that we have in our hands currently are either not adequate enough or are very expensive, and that the fact that uh, stamping out also is quite uh, damaging and expensive exercise, there's a need that we need to develop better tools for control of this disease, and especially a, a good vaccine against African swine fever. The good news is that uh, this is, this, it's very possible to develop a vaccine against this virus because uh, previous studies uh, from colleagues have shown cross protection that can be induced between genotypes. And uh, studies have also shown that in inhibition of infection in vitro by immune serum correlates well with cross protection observed in in vivo in different isolates. So there's also good correlation between interferon gamma cross reactivity and cross protection. And in this regard, therefore, uh, a number of vaccine strategies have been, uh, vaccine development strategies have been proposed. One is the development of recombinant African swine fever vaccines. Uh, for this, uh, the studies that have been shown so far uh, are promising because we see delay in onset of disease signs and viremia, and some pigs recover from infection and clear virus. Uh, but in other studies, we still see partial protection uh, that is achieved with recombinant proteins, especially those expressed in bacillovirus. And this calls for identification of additional protective antigens that are needed, especially the dominant ones that can be recognized by CD8 T cells. Now, the other approach for developing an African swine fever vac vaccine is the development of attenuated viruses. Uh, the reason why this is also promising is that given that the virus is a large double-stranded DNA, virus uh, with more accurate replication than RNA viruses. This results in a relatively stable genome. And this is very important when you want to develop the vaccine. And secondly, uh, the virus encodes for between about 800 and, uh, 160 to 175 genes. Some of these genes have been uh, identified 
uh, are notated and their functions are uh, well described. And most of these genes exist in multi-gene families that are responsible for either replication or providing structure for the virus or in the uh, virus multiplication. Now, uh, deletion of these genes can result in an attenuated virus then that can form uh, a vaccine. Uh, this attenuation can be done through either several passages in culture or through gene editing. Now, these attenuated, attenuated viruses, uh, though they are also promising, but they have some shortcomings. Uh, first, there are safety concerns about release of replicating virus vaccines. And the second, there's a requirement for high containment to produce it. And currently, uh, optimized cell cultures that are required for growth of the vaccine are not uh, either available, and those that are available are not well tested. Now, current strains may not be sufficiently attenuated. And that would mean also that for the genes that needs to be deleted, you need to identify more genes that are involved in virulence so that you can, we can guarantee the safety of the vaccines once they have been uh, proven. And uh, in this regard, uh, our collaboration between the Colorado State University and ILRI is trying to address some of this concern uh, in recombinant and uh, attenuated ASF, ASF vaccines to ensure that we generate a whole virus that can present itself to the immune system as an inactive particle uh, without causing adverse effects. So in this regard, uh, some of our, uh, our other workers have reviewed a number of processes that can uh, make this possible and especially chemical and biological mechanisms for pathogen reduction. And uh, out of this, uh, from the review that I'm presenting here, the Mirasol uh, technology has been shown to be des desirable. So we propose to use uh, this technology uh, in the collaboration that we have with CSU to develop a vaccine. Uh, and uh, the proposal is, uh, is in this system is that we use an endogenous photosensitizer such as riboflavin and UV light to carry out specific changes in the African swine fever DNA chemistry and use the modified uh, virus particle in vaccine preparations. The photochemistry of riboflavin and UV light has been shown to be specific to uh, nucleic acids and not induce damage or modification to proteins. So we will be able to generate a particle that contains all the antigenic targets and that has uh, no capacity for replication, especially uh, when it's used as a vaccine. Uh, in pigs. Now, we this technology is in existence as a commercial product and is basically used to treat uh, blood uh, for use in hospitals uh, for transfusion. Uh, the process of uh, in, uh, inactivation of pathogens in blood is very simple. It just involves a transfer of all blood unit to an illumination bag, and then you add uh, some riboflavin into the bag, eliminate the riboflavin and the blood in a mir mirasol system, and then the blood in a few minutes is ready for transfusion into patients that need the blood. So uh, the mirasol disposable products are well distributed globally. If you see from the picture, all the green areas uh, can access these products. And uh, there's a lot of market databases that have been generated uh, that show the effectiveness of this uh, product. And uh, to date, there's no related serious adverse events that have reported from the use of this product. And for this reason, we've selected this product uh, for use in our uh, process to develop uh, 
an efficacious African swine fever vaccine. And uh, uh, so far we've developed a clear work pipeline to do this. Uh, we'll be propagating, isolating and inactivating the virus particles. And the inactivated particles will be formulated into low, medium and high dose preparation using specific diluents and also uh, adjuvants. And uh, this then will be tested in vivo in animal challenges so that we can access the immune responses. So uh, depending on the immune responses that we get uh, and the reaction we get following a lethal challenge, we'll be able to determine whether this would give us a better vaccine uh, that is superior to uh, the others that are currently being developed. So in this regard, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this meeting for inviting uh, inviting me to present and I also thank my colleague uh, Ray Goodrich uh, from Colorado, Colorado State University who is a co-PI on this current initiative and uh, also the ILRI uh, team who are supporting this work and more specifically the Cobin Family Foundation who is funding the proof of concept of this project. Uh, thank you and keep. Hello, my name is Ray Goodrich. I serve as the executive director of the Infectious Disease Research uh, Center, and I'm also a professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Pathology here at Colorado State University. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the Solovax platform for creating vaccines for animal diseases. Just as a brief refresher, I think uh, information which uh, many, if not all of you are aware of relative to vaccines, there are many different ways to prepare vaccine candidates. Um, this is just a slide describing uh, some of those methods that have been employed with a number of different disease uh, candidates uh, that have been approached from different standpoints to create vaccines, whether they're subunit or conjugate. Uh, attenuated vaccines, or even a few that are missing here uh, relative to new technologies like messenger RNA, which we've all heard of most recently with regard to uh, vaccines for COVID-19. Um, there are also some very tried and true traditional approaches, such as the use of inactivated vaccines, uh, which include using whole microorganisms that can be destroyed by heat, by chemicals, radiation, antibodies, other approaches that neutralize the ability of the uh, particle to create disease. And there are numerous examples of how uh, those have been applied to the use uh, in addressing influenza, cholera, bubonic plague, polio. The Salk vaccine, I think, is one of the more famous examples of this. Um, in terms of making inactivated vaccines, there are a variety of approaches, but one of the more common ones is the use of chemical agents for vaccine production. And those chemicals include things like formalin, uh, ethylenamine, beta propiolactone. They basically work by disrupting the ability of the particle, virus particle, let's say for a virus vaccine, to replicate in some cases to attach to cells, they modify proteins, they modify components uh, of the particle and, and hence prevent it from being infectious. Um, and these have been very effective approaches that have been used over many years to create vaccine candidates, but they have some downsides primarily associated with the fact that they do alter proteins, they do alter epitopes that are present in these particles, and hence may create something that looks like the original uh, particle that you're trying to vaccinate against, uh, but is not necessarily as comparable as it needs to be in order to elicit the most effective and efficient immune response. That's where the approach that we're using comes into play. It is based on a methodology. There's been a lot written about this uh, and a lot published on it over the years. Uh, this is a review uh, that my colleagues and I did uh, several years ago, uh, describing chemical and biological method mechanisms of pathogen reduction technologies. Uh, as I mentioned, these approaches have been used for treating blood products to prevent transfusion transmitted disease. And the basic concept is, to utilize a photochemical which can associate 
or direct to the chemical action that occurs when you um, shine the light on these solutions to generate chemistry that leads to modifications of nucleic acids and disruption of those nucleic acids in a way that prevents replication processes. So vaccines that are created by these processes can't replicate, but by virtue of the specificity of the chemistry, also maintain uh, the nature of the, of the composition and the structure of the epitopes, the antigens that are present on their surface, maintain them in a pristine state. And so the concept is to be able to create an inactivated vaccine while maintaining a structure that is as close to the natural uh, pathogen that you're trying to um, vaccinate against. I often describe this as an uh, example of having uh, an egg that you scramble uh, by some means, scramble the yolk inside the egg, but you leave the shell intact. It isn't until you, you open it up that you uh, understand that the nucleic acid has been disrupted, that the, the equivalent of the yolk, so to speak, uh, but the virus particle itself, its antigens, uh, remain intact and, and present in a natural way to the immune system. The way we do this with the Solovax process is basically by using a chemical riboflavin, which is also vitamin B2, a very common uh, component of our food, uh, and, a, and, a, and a vitamin, which is essential to our health. Um, but when it is exposed to UV light in the presence of components that contain nucleic acids, and this is wave, uh, UV light at specific wavelengths, it is able to cause a disruption of the nucleic acid structure, primarily by modifications to guanine bases uh, through an electron transfer mediated chemistry that results in the, the inability of that uh, signal, that nucleic acid signal to be read and to be utilized for the production of new intact uh, virions in this case. So that's the concept. Because that chemistry is so specific relative to the action on nucleic acid, there is no cross-linking, there is no oxidation of protein components that are present in the, the viral particle in this case. It's a way of being able to create an inactivated uh, viral vaccine uh, without destroying the natural epitopes and natural antigens that are present uh, in these products. We've done some work here at Colorado State University. This is in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Steng Stenglein, who runs the next generation uh, sequencing facilities that we have here at Colorado State University. And Mark and his group have looked at products that are treated of uh, uh, virus particle. This is an example of SARS-CoV-2. We're applying this technology in the generation of a of a uh, vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, which is in preclinical testing right now. Uh, and Mark's work was really able to show uh, at the molecular level that we are seeing the modifications uh, occur uh, to gu at guanine residues in particular, just as the chemistry predicted, and that they're occurring at a high frequency, which is distinct from that which may occur uh, due to natural processes. Um, and so a very definitive confirmation of the chemistry and biology, which has been documented again in, in articles that have been published over many years uh, with this kind of approach in a blood uh, sterilization uh, type of technology uh, application. So our interest was, of course, in being able to apply this uh, very broadly. And one of the advantages of that is the fact that in the um, area of, of blood treatment and, and processing, uh, there is a lot of experience going back to when this product was first introduced in the 2007-2008 timeframe uh, to uh, treat blood products. There are locations around the world where this is now routinely used and has been used now for uh, 13, 14 years. Um, to treat blood products, and these products are then used and transfused into patients, uh, has a very good safety record and a very good record of being able uh, to prevent disease transmission in these various locations. And these are just some of the examples of centers that I've visited over the years, places in Uganda and Spain and Ghana and Russia uh, that have um, utilized the technology and use it in routine. So the equipment is, again, very compact. The procedures can be carried out in standard blood banking environments, which are the equivalent of BSL-2 uh, type laboratories where human uh, products or biological materials can be routinely handled. 
integrating this into a system for production of a vaccine, it means integrating it into the uh, uh, processes where you're normally creating um, uh, through culture, uh, static cultures, or through um, uh, bioreactor systems uh, to grow up the virus in its native state. In a, in a wild type state, and then carry it through the inactivation process, and then also use standardized methodologies that are associated with um, viral uh, production, viral vaccine production today. Uh, so a lot of filtration, chromatography, purification, and then uh, fill into the final um, into the final vials. And that could be done with or without excipients for stabilization, uh, with or without adjuvants that might be part of the formulation. And that's actually part of the work that's being done right now by Biomark uh, in the development of a COVID-19 vaccine utilizing uh, this approach. And that work is funded uh, both through BARDA and the National Institutes of Health. Um, the advantages of this approach are basically, as you've just seen, described, that it's a transportable technology. Uh, you can bring the solution to the problem. And certainly with the work that we're doing with the International Livestock Research uh, Institute in Nairobi, Kenya, that's what we've done. Uh, bringing the equipment, bringing the solutions, bringing the process uh, to the site where uh, African swine fever is uh, present. Uh, uh, and where the know-how exists to be able to handle those agents and to study uh, the impact that they may have on uh, pork populations um, in, in then to utilize this technology to generate vaccines where the efficacy can be uh, tested in a very straightforward way. So rather than bring the problem to us, the bring the virus to us, we brought the sol potential solution uh, to the site where the disease uh, is present and may be present in outbreak uh, to see if we can apply this uh, directly on site. The nature of the chemical agents and equipment uh, that are required to do this really reduces the environmental and occupational health concerns of being able to handle uh, agents like formalin, beta propiolactone, ethylenamine, which are all carcinogenic, all pose issues from an environmental health and safety standpoint, and really has been a driver for many organizations that create vaccines to move away uh, from inactivated vaccines uh, to seek other approaches. So utilizing uh, an innocuous chemical like riboflavin and UV light to do this process really may open up the potential to be able to do this in more locations in a more straightforward and efficient way. Uh, our intent with this also through the better preservation of antigen, the hypothesis that we would be better able to preserve antigens using this kind of selective photochemical approach could result in better dose batch figures and hence more rapid scale up in production of vaccines. Um, what we really wanna produce is an attenuated virus in characteristics only it's 100% attenuated. And so it's unable to replicate, but the, the protein content looks as similar and as comparable to the native wild type virus that may be present. And again, as that wild type uh, virus profile may change, the, the way to address that with this kind of approach is simply to change the composition of the starting material that you uh, begin the inactivation process with. And hence, uh, the ability to address new emerging variants or uh, different types of strains uh, may be more facile using this kind of an approach. And clearly, I think um, the cost profile of being able to do this, uh, it's been done in routine in many places in the world for treating blood products. Um, and the cost profile has been a very important feature uh, for uh, that technology as well, uh, just from the standpoint of uh, providing transfusion products at affordable cost at different locations in both high income and low income index, index nations uh, around the world. And so with this approach, we believe that um, one of the potential benefits uh, would be able to make this technology available to make these kinds of solutions uh, to vaccine production needs available on a global basis on, in both a way that is logistically and economically feasible and practical. 
uh, you'll hear more about this work in uh, the, the description of the specific applications to African swine fever uh, that are being done in collaboration with the International Livestock Research Foundation under the direction of Dr. Edward O'Koth, um, wonderful collaborator and colleague. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, the data from this work applied in the veterinary vaccine world uh, with this technology in the coming months. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and um, there may be an opportunity to address questions at a later point in the program. Thank you very much. I'm Lindsay Hartson. I'm a laboratory manager here at the Infectious Disease Research Center at Colorado State University. We're going to be giving a demonstration of our Solivex technology. Solivex is a process we've developed here at CSU where we've repurposed a device that was originally invented to help with blood safety and are using it now to create a vaccine. Uh, we've used this technology. Uh, currently, it's in process with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. But we're also really interested in using this with other viruses and other applications such as African swine fever. So the equipment you see in front of me um, is really what is, has been used in the blood center where uh, the device and the process uh, is originally intended. One of the benefits of the Solovax process is its simplicity. Um, so there are just a, a couple of quick steps that are needed to create this whole virion inactivated type of vaccine using the process. Um, so the first step in the process is to take your virus uh, that you're interested in inactivating, creating the vaccine for. I'm gonna place it in what's called a, a sterile tubing welder. So what we need to do is transfer the virus into our treatment bag. This is the bag that we will use to perform the inactivation step for the virus. I'm gonna go ahead and connect these two bags together. And what this device does is it helps us connect two bags together, two containers together in a sterile way without having to use a biosafety cabinet um, in, in keeping or maintaining that sterile environment within the product. All right, so we create this nice weld, this nice connection here on the tubing. Uh, the second part of the Solovex process um, in is both using UV light, which we'll use in a minute to inactivate um, the product, but also the use of a riboflavin solution. Riboflavin is a photosensitizer and is really what performs the magic here of this technology. When you expose riboflavin to UV light, um, it acts on the nucleic acids of the, the, the virus or other pathogens um, and helps the inactivation to occur in an irreversible way so that those pathogens can't use their uh, standard repair mechanisms to reverse that kind of damage. So again, uh, we're gonna need to transfer this riboflavin into the bag along with the virus. So that's what I'm going to do now is set up that connection. So now we have our treatment bag, our virus, and our riboflavin solution all connected together. So let's do the transfer. So now we're going to transfer the virus and the riboflavin solution into our treatment bag. I'm going to pinch open these welds that were created when we connected the two uh, pieces of tubing together. We'll open the clamp here on this treatment bag. Mm -hmm. 
So now that we've transferred all of the fluid into the treatment bag, the next step is to remove all of the residual air that you see in the product. That's important because we really wanna have a controlled and activation process. If we're leaving a lot of air in the bag, um, it leads to a lot of oxidative, extra oxidative damage with the air that's, that's present. So we need to remove that from the product. We'll open this clamp here and we simply just squeeze the air back up into the riboflavin bag which is now empty and sometimes it just takes a couple of turns here to get all of these stray bubbles and then we allow the rest of the product to drain down back into the treatment bag so now that we have removed the residual air from the product we need to remove uh, our product bag and the riboflavin bag, which are now empty from the rest of the set so that we can perform the inactivation step. So what I'm gonna do is use a standard tubing sealer to create a weld here on this inlet line tubing, and then we'll be able to disconnect the two. And you can see the seal right here. And just pull those apart and we discard what we no longer need. Right, so now that we've prepared our product for treatment, I'm going to take you through the inactivation process. So this is the illuminator that we're using, the device that delivers the UV light dose to the product that now contains the riboflavin solution. So there's a touchpad here that asks you for some basic pieces of information about the process, including the operator who's performing the process, as well as what type of product um, that you're inactivating, and then the energy dose you'd like to deliver to perform that inactivation. So I'm going to enter that information now. All right, so I'm gonna use a barcode scanner to scan the expiration date and lot number of the treatment kit that I'm using for the process. And then here is where I give it the energy dose I'd like it to deliver. I confirm all of that information and now I'm ready to place the product in the illuminator. So the bag can only be um, placed in here and loaded in one in one direction in one way we have different size pins here on the platen to ensure that that's the case to help guide the operator to load it appropriately we'll close this clamp to make sure it doesn't go anywhere during the process during illumination this platen moves back and forth to create good mixing of the product so that we have uniform exposure to the UV light. And then this is a holder that holds all this excess tubing so it's not floating around um, in the space. And then we close the drawer and that signals to the device we're ready to begin treatment. So right now the bulbs are warming up, the UV bulbs, and getting to that target intensity. The energy dose that's required to inactivate the virus in a standard media, which is what we're using today, is really very small. Again, this product was developed uh, to treat blood products, and that requires much more energy because you've got the cellular and protein components in those kinds of products. But when we're only treating virus and media, all of those aspects of it have been removed. And so you need very little UV light um, in essence to inactivate all of the virus in the bag. And that's it. I would say that process took 30 seconds to a minute for illumination. And then the illuminator has indicated to us that treatment was successful. So at this step, we open the drawer and remove the product. And once we open the clamp, we can confirm that the process was successful and move on to treating your next dose. Well, I think you saw from the demonstration one of the features of this approach that's very appealing is the ability to transport it to locations like the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya, where we can address the application of this technology directly to diseases like African swine fever. The approach utilizes a very innocuous chemical, riboflavin or vitamin B2, 
Uh, it utilizes UV light in the very simple systems, the devices and the disposables uh, that you've seen. And that feature allows us to take the technology to the problem, uh, to be able to carry out the research in a space where the disease is endemic, rather than bringing the disease to our research labs to do that type of work. Um, I think that's one of the potential great advantages of this approach, the ability to potentially regionalize uh, the response mechanisms for the development of countermeasures uh, to human and agriculture-based uh, diseases that impact humans and animals.